Was the internet invented to be a government weapon? Who invented it? Where did the idea come from? How do ideas like the internet even happen? All this and more in what's probably going to be the longest episode of this series, but stick with me. It's relatively short considering the scope of what we're going to cover, what the internet really is, and how it came to be, and why most everything else you've read about its history is wrong, or at least drastically oversimplified. The internet is amazing, and it's changing every day. <laughs> read anything about the history of the internet, the story usually begins with how the U.S. military invented the internet in the midst of the Cold War as a command and control communication system that could withstand nuclear attack. The History Channel tells us the internet got its start in the United States more than 50 years ago as a government weapon. In Bruce Sterling's concise and well-written short history of the internet, he begins by explaining how the Rand Corporation, America's foremost Cold War think tank, faced a strange strategic problem. How could the U.S. authorities successfully communicate after a nuclear war? Post-nuclear America would need a command and control network linked from city to city, state to state, base to base. At the time, if you wanted to build a communications network, say like the telephone system, you implemented hierarchical design, a centralized network. But in a centralized network, if you take out the center, you compromise the entire system. Rand's solution, the brainchild of Rand staffer Paul Durand, Sterling explains, was to build a distributed network. Network controlled equally by every node, a network with no center point of control and thus no weak spot. So many historical accounts begin this way. In the first sentence of the very first chapter of Alexander Galloway's amazing book, Protocol, How Control Exists After Decentralization, he writes, it's clear that in many ways the internet was built to withstand nuclear attack. The net was designed as a solution to the vulnerability of the military's centralized system of command and control. Paul Buran at the Rand Corporation decided to create a computer network that was independent of centralized command and control and would thus be able to withstand a nuclear attack. This is important information because as I discussed in the last video, those who create technologies always embed within it, intentionally or not, their biases. So naturally, lots of artists and critical theorists have made work and arguments based on the internet's inherent military bias. Because after all, the net was developed as a communications platform capable of withstanding nuclear attack, as Doug Rushkoff reminds us in his critically important book, Program or Be Programmed. And these would all be sound arguments if in fact Paul Buran at Rand had created a computer network. But they didn't. So what's going on here? Where's the whole military bias enter into the internet's story? Well, before we go down that road, it's important to understand what the internet is. Because when I hear the internet, I tend to think of these things. Others tend to think of this. But in reality, it's this. Put simply, a computer network is when you connect one or more computers together, usually with cables, so they can share information. The internet is a globally distributed network of networks. Your computer might be connected to your router over Wi-Fi, i.e. radio waves, and then a series of cables owned by your ISP connect your router to an exchange building nearby where it's connected to a bunch of other networks and cables, including these massive transoceanic cables. Those are literal cables laid into the ocean floor by boats with giant spools where they can get bitten by sharks. This, this is a thing that happens. There's so many cables making up so many networks with so many connections to other networks that today you can very easily send a message from your computer to any other computer almost anywhere else in the world instantly. That's physically traveling across, a, across the world instantly. So obviously the US military doesn't own these physical cables. They're owned by many different entities around the world. So what about all this nuclear war machine stuff? For that, we've got to go back a few decades to the internet's invention. Let's quote the military think tank guy everyone keeps referencing as having created the internet, Paul Buran at the Rand Corporation. The process of technological development is like building a cathedral. Over the course of the several hundred years, new people come along and each lays down a block on top of the old foundations, each saying, I built a cathedral. Next month, another block is placed atop the previous one, then comes along a historian who asks, well, who built the cathedral? If you're not careful, you can con yourself into believing that you did the most important part. But the reality is that each contribution has to follow onto previous work. Everything is tied to everything else. Not surprisingly, there was no single inventor of the physical network of networks. Even the idea of the internet, like all great ideas, is impossible to pinpoint. Lots of folks had lots of ideas that sound a lot like what we call the internet today, going way back. But for the sake of starting somewhere, I'll start with a brilliant American psychologist in the field of psychoacoustics named J.C.R. Licklater, who went humbly by Lick. It's been hard to uh, share information for years. The 
printing press, of course, was the great step into sharing information, but the printing press didn't essentially handle the problem of distributing it. It handled the problem of copying it. And we have been needing for a long time some better way to distribute information than to carry it about. The print on paper form is uh, embarrassing because in order to distribute it, you've got to move the paper around. And lots of paper gets to be bulky and heavy and expensive to move about. In the 1950s, Lick became obsessed with computers and wrote some incredibly influential papers. In a time when computers were giant, often screenless machines programmed with switches and punch cards, Lick envisioned a future of seamless man-computer symbiosis. Lick also had a vision of a, quote, intergalactic computer network, a term that referred to both his community of computer folks scattered across the states, but also alluded to a future computer network that would enable them all to communicate much more efficiently than ever. This was a vision he infected many of his friends and colleagues with, including a guy named Robert W. Taylor, who in the mid to late 60s served as the director of computer research at the Advanced Research Projects Agency, a.k.a. ARPA. Here's where the military sort of enters the picture. See, in 1957, Russia launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik 1, into orbit. Sputnik 1 wasn't a nuclear weapon, but it was an intellectual threat. It represented Russia's technical superiority in the midst of the Cold War. In response, the following year, President Eisenhower established a couple new agencies with the purpose of dramatically stepping up our tech game as a country, NASA and ARPA. ARPA specifically was meant to be a quick response agency that would exist outside of what President Eisenhower referred to as the military industrial complex, which he was real skeptical of, of at the time. So at ARPA, Taylor's job was essentially to find computer folks doing cutting edge stuff and fund their projects. And Taylor was amazing at this. Before ARPA, Taylor was at NASA where he funded Doug Engelbart's invention of the computer mouse. After he left ARPA, he assembled a team at Xerox of all places that would go on to invent things like ethernet, laser printers, and the modern day graphical user internet interface, without which many of us probably wouldn't be using computers today. While at ARPA, Taylor initiated the ARPANET project, employing Dr. Lawrence Roberts as captain of the ship that would eventually become the internet. So here's an important point. This isn't the Cold War military think tank Rand referenced earlier in all those other quotes. This is a far out computer research agency named ARPA. Neither Roberts nor Taylor were concerned with nuclear war. They were both very much influenced by J.C.R. Licklater's papers, and Taylor in particular was thinking about the research community. In an interview, he explained that creating a computer network like the one Lick imagined would expand the sociological phenomenon of collaboration in the research community, of resource sharing, which in those days meant not software but sharing computers themselves. It would help avoid the doubling up of research and generally get things cross-pollinating so that folks could build on top of each other's ideas and work. This was his primary motive for wanting wanting to do the ARPANET. ARPA was set up as a quick response agency, which meant it was a lot easier to fund interesting projects like this one than it would be at another government agency. Taylor explains, ARPA wasn't like the NSF, the National Science Foundation. If I wanted to start a project in ARPA, the only person I had to convince was my boss. I didn't have to have a board come in and do an evaluation. And that's exactly how the ARPANET got its funding. One day in February of 1966, Taylor walked into Charles Hertzfield's office, the director of ARPA, and Taylor's boss at the time, and with no real formal proposal, he just explained that he wanted to build a network that would connect these interactive communities into a larger community in such a way that a user of one community could connect to a distant community as though that user were in his own local system, in his own local computer system. And after just a 20 minute chat, he was approved for a million bucks. Quote, the computer research program was totally unclassified. It had nothing to do with anything military. In fact, when the ARPA director would go before Congress, some congressman or congressional staff guy would say about a particular project, well, how does this help the Department of Defense X project? And the director of ARPA would typically say, this helps the nation and therefore helps the Department of Defense. Sadly, but perhaps unsurprisingly, that attitude didn't last. By the late 1960s, the government had slashed ARPA's budget in half. Its new director promised Congress the agency would be more mission-oriented. And in 1972, ARPA became DARPA, the agency we today associate with killer robots. Taylor recounts that, quote, they saw fit to rename ARPA DARPA in order to put the word defense in front of Advanced Research Projects Agency, in order to appease the Congress who were more inclined to give defense dollars their approval than just research dollars. At this point, Taylor left the agency. However, in 1969, just before the culture shift at ARPA, the ARPANET was already underway. Its first two nodes were UCLA and SRI. It was from UCLA that internet pioneer Leonard Kleinrock and his team transmitted the first message, the word login, over the ARPANET to SRI. Well, he almost sent the word login. It actually crashed right after they sent the second character, the O, 
you know, because reasons. You see, in those days, it wasn't as simple as running a cable between two computers. The trick was getting all the bits across reliably, and that's where protocols come in. So earlier, we established that the internet is simply a network of networks. It's a bunch of computers connected together, but that's really only half of it. The internet's great achievement was less connecting all the computers and more having gotten them all to speak the same new distributed language. Protocols are like the rules of the road. They're technical specifications for exactly how bits should flow from one computer on the network to another. The most important of these, if not the most popular, is a pair called TCP IP, invented by internet pioneers Vinton Cerf and Robert Kahn, with the help of many other folks. And in this type of network, this computer, for example, would talk to this computer, not by sending in a message directly, since there is no circuit, but sending a message first to this computer, which would then store it and forward it onto this computer, thereby acting as a relay. But that wouldn't happen for another few years. So let's go back to the beginning and those first couple of nodes on the ARPANET in the late 60s. This is where the whole nuclear war think tank enters the picture. At the time, if you wanted to send a message across a network from one node to another, you'd establish a dedicated communications channel. This method was called circuit switching, and it's how all the telephone networks worked. But there was a new idea in the air, which would later be known as packet switching, a radical idea where you'd take a message, you'd cut it up into little smaller address pieces, which would find their own way across a dynamically shared and distributed network, hopping from node to node, and then piecing themselves back together on the other end. Of course, I'm oversimplifying bits here, pun intended. But what I want to stress is that this is a key feature of the ARPANET, and later the internet. Packet switching protocols is what makes distributed peer-to-peer -peer network possible. But why even make this computer network as a distributed one? Why not just make the ARPANET centralized, like the telephones? Here's where Paul Barand and the nuclear war argument comes in. Paul Barand was an insanely forward-thinking engineer at RAND, who was indeed compelled to fix the fragility of the command and control issues of the Cold War. And he indeed wrote groundbreaking papers on exactly how that could be possible via what he called distributed adaptive message block switching. But when RAND actually tried to get AT&T, who controlled the telephone system at the time, to build that network, they refused. And after many arguments with the establishment, Paul Barand kind of gave up. A great idea could have been lost forever because of AT&T's short-sightedness, but the amazingly peculiar thing about great ideas is that they tend to be arrived at independently by different folks for different reasons at the same time. It's a phenomenon that goes by many different names, simultaneous invention, undiscovered public knowledge, multiple discovery. You should check out this video to learn more about that idea, specifically the bit after the credits. So all the while, Baran had no idea that the folks at ARPA were working on similar ideas, nor did they know about Baran's research. So if not for the sake of surviving nuclear attack, why then did the ARPA guys decide to go with this unprecedented distributed network approach? And where did the idea come from? In the early 60s, Leonard Kleinrock, who later would send that first ARPANET message from UCLA to SRI, had done his PhD dissertation on similar ideas for different reasons. He explained this to me over email saying, I found myself at MIT surrounded by computers and I realized that sooner or later these computers would need to communicate with each other. I also realized that the existing telephone network was woefully inadequate for such communication. What was needed was a new network technology. In his office at ARPA, Bob Taylor would also find himself surrounded by computers that couldn't communicate. He actually had three separate incompatible terminals in his office, so like the problem was staring at him every day when he came to work. So clearly these computers needed to start talking to each other, but if not for fear of nuclear fallout, why else connect them together in this distributed fashion? Well, if you ask Bob Taylor, he'd tell you it was due to his 1960s counterculture sensibilities. He explained, I don't trust large organizations. I didn't trust centralized control of anything. There was a whole host of related gut feelings that some people had those days, and I was one of those people. Gut feelings aside, there were technical reasons for distributing control of the network. When I asked him about the Cold War influence on the ARPANET's distributed nature, Leonard Kleinrock explained to me that it was clear to him that, quote, the only way a data network could scale up large, say, in the number of nodes, would be to distribute the control function across many, if not all, the nodes. The idea of distributed control was to allow the network to scale and was not motivated by concerns of vulnerability to attack. Of course, that protection against attack came as a free benefit of designing for scalability. Another internet pioneer in the ARPA circle named Wesley Clark would explain to Taylor and Roberts a practical way of implementing these ideas using a subnet of special computers called IMPs, or interface message processors, which were a kind of ancestor to the modern day home modem or router. Here we have the first piece of internet equipment ever installed in the internet. At that time it was called a packet switch now called a router. 
So while Paul Baran was doing his military research, the ARPA folks were working on the same problem, but for different reasons. And because history is a set of intermingled narratives, though up until now this has been a pretty US-centric story, what I failed to mention is that at the very same time, the internet was also being invented, unrelated to the Cold War, in the UK at the National Physical Laboratory. There, a Welsh computer scientist named Donald Davies helped develop the MPL network, another distributed computer network. It was actually Davies, not any of the folks in the States, who coined the term packet switching. Initially, they didn't know about each other because they didn't have the internet to look each other up, but eventually, thanks to conferences and stuff, they would become aware of each other's research and, in fact, influence each other quite a bit. By the mid-70s, the ARPANET connected with the NPL network, which would later also connect to yet another distributed computer network in France called Cyclades. And somewhere in there, amidst all these different factors, factors and influences, the internet was born. So was the internet invented to be a nuclear war machine, as the History Channel and so many others tell us? Not really. The truth, as it tends to be, is a little bit more complicated. The internet's distributed nature came from a few different places for a few different reasons. To give Paul Baran all the credit, and indeed to assume then that some inherent military interest is embedded in these protocols, would be a mistake. As Paul Baran said himself, I have been embarrassed on occasion by people improperly giving me credit for creating the ARPANET. Of course I did not create the ARPANET or the internet. Yes, I did seem to have invented packet switching as far as I could tell. And yes, packet switching was used in the ARPANET and in the internet. And yes, packet switching did give the internet some of its novel properties, but I only did this one piece of the underlining technology. Another person came along later and independently came up with much the same stuff. So I don't feel that I deserve any excessive credit. So in the 60s, the ARPANET was born, but so was the NPL network and the Cyclades network from a combination of military, scientific, and commercial contexts. They all became friends in the 1970s, linking themselves together to form the internet. In many ways, the core protocols that make all the communication possible had their development heyday in the 1980s, at which point in the US anyways, the National Science Foundation was also heavily involved in funding and growing infrastructure, introducing a very heavy research and educational bias into its development. In the States, there were commercial restrictions, but those got lifted in the 1990s, while over in Europe, the World Wide Web was invented, which we'll be talking about in the next Next video. The result of which was the mass adoption of the internet uh, by non-computer folks all around the world, and it's been growing and changing ever since. Okay, so moral of the story. As I discussed in the last video, all technologies are biased, and as internet artists, the ability to tease out these biases is one of the most important critical skills we need to develop. And to do this well, you have to look beyond a single blog post, beyond a single sort of history channel article. The real histories are never so linear and clean. In reference to some of the historical misattribution, Paul Baran said, quote, I believe that there is a growing problem by the popular media interviewing only individuals who believe that history started the day they were first exposed to the field. The news reporter with a short deadline, a predetermined storyline, and a cute title to maximize the audience, unfortunately creates Oliver Stone type views of history. Going back to unravel the inevitable mess and the piling up of later work on top of earlier work takes time and effort. So there it is. Hopefully you've put in the time and effort to make it to the end of this video. I know it was a long one. In the next video, we'll be talking about my favorite part of the internet, browsers and the World Wide Web. But before that, if folks have any thoughts or questions about the internet, its history or how it works, leave them in the comments so we can all sort of chat about it. Uh, if you want to learn more, I've also got links to all of the sources for all the stuff that I've talked about in this video in the description. If you like this video, share it with uh, any friends, other artists and makers, and don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button so that the algorithms know that they should recommend it to other folks as well. With that said, see you in the next video.